Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about something called the marketing environment. And I'm going to use I-95 and driving on I-95 to sort of set the table um, for just how important the marketing environment is and what it entails. Okay, so pretend like you're driving on 95, all right? And um, if even if you've never driven on 95 or you've probably been a passenger on 95, you know that compared to driving through, say, Delaware County, um, there's just a lot more cars typically, especially if it's rush hour. Um, people are going varying speeds, right? So you got people that are doing 55 and you might have people that are doing close to 90. You have people coming on and off of exits. It can be complete chaos. And so typically, and I'll, I'll just speak personally, when I drive on major highways, I really utilize my mirrors, right? So I'm looking in my rear view mirror, my passenger, my driver's side mirror, because those mirrors help me pay attention to what in the world is going on around me um, so that I don't get in an accident or I don't cause an accident. Furthermore, though, it, those mirrors don't just help me protect myself and my family. Um, they help me find opportunities. So, for example, if I need to bear right on 495, which I do all the time driving from Maryland, I'm constantly checking that right mirror to make sure or to find an opportunity for there to be space and me to get to my right. So think of the marketing environment as what's going on around you externally uh, that if you're a company, you got to pay attention to because if you don't pay attention to it, you could either be threatened or you could miss an opportunity. And what I mean by that is, is if you're selling a product, you could be threatened by changes in that environment or you could miss an opportunity to reach new customers, create something new, change your marketing mix. So think of that marketing environment as things that are going on outside of a company that could either hurt it or help it. And we'll talk about the various components of the marketing environment. So these are the ones that we're going to talk about. And try not to get bogged down by this slide. I'm, I'm going to touch briefly on each one of these and give you some really good examples of what's going on in each one of these environments. So I'm not going to read this slide. Just know that these are the five environments that we're going to talk about. Um, before we start talking about each of these five environments, though, it's important to set the stage um, and talk a little bit about where marketers come up with their plans or where they come up with their strategies, right? So before they can even start to look at the environments around them, they do have to pay attention to what, what is going on within their internal environment. So that's their company itself. And I'm sure if you've taken Intro to Business before, you know that companies have what are known as strategic goals, right? And these are like long-term goals. And the marketing strategies, the products that companies develop, all those marketing decisions, believe it or not, are supposed to be founded on a set of goals that guide the company as a whole. And, you know, I'm going to use Whole Foods as an example, if you don't mind. I'm actually taking uh, doctoral classes right now. I'm trying to finish my doctorate in business. And um, I just did an, a financial analysis of Whole Foods. So if you don't mind, I know more about Whole Foods right now than I care, uh, <laughs> than I care to mention. So I'm going to use them as an example. Um, so let's talk about Whole Foods, for example. They have a mission statement, right? And if you're not familiar with what a mission statement is, that's sort of like the guiding principle. It's sort of a philosophical statement that guides a company. In addition to having a mission statement, companies sometimes will list what their values are, right? So these are also a set of guiding principles. But fundamentally, like I said in our first conversation, companies got to earn a profit, right? It's got to make money for its stockholders. And at the end of the day, if it's not earning a profit, its mission statement and its values, its marketing, pro its, its marketing mix, its products, they don't mean anything because the company is not going to last if they're not earning a profit. So let's talk about Whole Foods. They're, they're a great example. They have a pretty strong mission statement and a pretty strong set of values. They're absolutely interested in earning a profit, right? And if you read their website, you see it's clear they want to earn a profit. But they also want to do a whole host of other things, right? They want to take care of their employees. But that's why they pay their employees incredibly well. They give their employees, whether you're full-time or part-time, they offer you um, a 401k plan, which allows you to retire. They also offer health care benefits for all their employees. So they really believe that if they serve their, um, their employees, that in turn their customers are going to be happy, right? Which makes a lot of sense, but it also costs them a lot of money. The other thing that, uh, that uh, uh, Whole Foods does 
is it really takes care of their suppliers. So the people that are giving or selling to them their produce, their meat, their fish. And a really core value of that organization is that they really want to source locally. So if they're selling apples in Baltimore City, they want to try to get apples from Pennsylvania or from the Maryland area. They try to avoid going to Argentina or you know Central American countries to source their food because they think it's it's crazy to have an apple shipped all the way from South America. Why not try to have the apple shipped you know from 50 miles away? It takes care of local economies and so on and so forth, and it's better for the environment. So everything that Whole Foods does in terms of marketing stems from these set of values and these mission statements. And really, really good companies make sure that their strategic goals align with their marketing goals. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of these environments. Let's talk about the competitive environment. All right, I'm sure that this is probably Captain Obvious. What is the competitive environment? All around a company, there are competitors, right? There's people that are trying to sway and attract consumers toward them and away from you. So if you're Whole Foods, you have competition like you can't believe, right? You have Wegmans. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Wegmans, but in Maryland, we just there a Wegmans just opened up. They sell very similar products to Whole Foods, which is you know organic, high quality natural foods. And here's the thing about the competitive environment. Right? There's an old saying, my, my father said this to me on a number of occasions, occasions growing up, and that was, keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. Meaning, if you don't pay attention, just like my example of I-95, if you don't pay attention to what's going on around you, what your competition's doing, how they're changing and adapting, you could be threatened. Consequently, if they make changes, you might see opportunities. In the case of Whole Foods, they saw that you know a lot of traditional retail, grocery retailers, we're selling what are called conventional products. And conventional products are products that, you know, really don't have any major standards by way of organic, you know, the use of pesticides, the use of hormones in, in their products. And Whole Foods saw this as an opportunity and said, hey, nobody right now is doing this. Let's offer high quality organic products and let's see if we can meet needs in the market, which they absolutely don't. If you if you've looked at the, the demand for organic foods, it's it's quadrupled in the last 10 years. So you need to be aware of the com competitive environment because you got to be able to adapt to those changes. The next environment we'll talk about is the technological environment. And boy, if there's anything that changes more quickly than the technological environment, I don't know what it is because technology is is just changing ridiculously. Just right now, I'm using this screencast called Snagit, and <laughs> I'm I'm pretty I've been pretty bad with it at first, but I'm getting better. Um, but before Snagit, just last year, I used Screencast. So there's constant changes going on in the technological environment that can present threats and opportunities to companies as well. Um, if you if you look here, I have Google, and um, you know, in April, Google just purchased uh, a company that makes uh, drones. And you might be thinking, why in the world is Google interested in drones, right? Especially since drones typically have a pretty negative connotation in today's um, you know, political environment. Why are they buying a drone company? And I've included a link to a Wall Street Journal article if you're interested. But what's amazing is that the reason why Google, or their speculation, the reason why Google is interested in, in the drone market is because drones have the capability of, uh, you know, sitting in an atmosphere for years. So what does that tell you? What's Go Google probably looking at? They're probably looking at getting into the market of delivering internet service to people, right? And who's delivering internet service right now? Right? You got Comcast, you got Fios. So Google sees a technological opportunity in the marketplace and they think, hey, maybe we're not just a search engine, right? Maybe we're not just a web browser or we don't offer Google Docs. Maybe we actually offer internet service. So this is just one example of a company paying attention to what's going on in the marketing environment and trying to respond to it. All right, let's talk about the economic environment. The economic environment, if you've taken macro or microeconomics, then maybe some of this te terminology I have on the screen here is familiar to you. Um, there's changes in the economy all the time, right? If you, if you can remember 2007, 2008, and 2009, our country went through a major economic recession. And what that means is, an economic recession is, is that individuals are having a harder time uh, spending their money on things like going to the movies or purchasing some of some of the things that would satisfy their wants instead during those years 
individuals spent more time purchasing goods that they actually needed, right? So we understand the difference between wants and needs. Um, I need water, I need utilities, I need to pay my mortgage. Um, those are things that I have to have to take care of my family. Um, that's a little bit different than wants. I would love to go to Hawaii. What Do I want to go to Hawaii? Oh, hell yeah, I want to go to Hawaii. Um, but I, I, I don't need Hawaii and I certainly can't afford Hawaii. Um, and so those kinds of purchases are, are put off. And that's what happens during an economic respe recession. Consumer spending starts to go down. Um, other things that can impact the economy um, are things like inflation. So if prices start to go up, that could certainly impact a company because if prices, if it costs more to buy flour or more to buy corn, right? Now, if I'm Walmart and I'm selling, you know, frozen corn, I may have to consider increasing my price of corn to consumers. Um, exchange rates, so a lot of the products that we buy are made in China. So, and, and what, what that means is that, you know, our dollar here um, is going to be worth a different value in China. We have to actually um, transfer or exchange our dollars to buy goods from China and businesses. This doesn't really affect us as much as consumers because we don't have to change our dollars into into Chinese currency, but businesses certainly have to. Absolutely. So exchange rates can actually affect um, marketing as well. And then interest rates. And if you have a car loan or you have a credit card, you know that interest rates can be um, can impact how much a car costs, right? If you get a great interest rate at 2.99% that car is actually going to be cheaper in the long run. If your interest rate is 10%, my goodness, it's going to be substantially larger. And businesses depend on borrowing money for operations. So they borrow money all the time. So as interest rates go up, um, it becomes more expensive. Right now, interest rates are so low. So for the most part, companies with good credit can borrow money relatively inexpensively. But again, if you're a marketer, you're a company, you got to pay attention to what's going on in the economic environment because it's going to impact you. You might decide to lower prices or increase prices or not do so much advertising um, if there's changes in the economic environment. So let's see, the, the um, next environment that we'll talk about, and I think we just have two more, is the political and legal environment. So what does that mean? The political and legal environment um, relates to things that are going on um, externally uh, that a marketer has to pay attention to. So I, I'm going to use the example of um, consumer protection laws and international markets. So BPA, I don't know if you guys are familiar with BPA. It's it's the, the full term for it is bisphenol A. Okay, so what is bisphenol A? And I'm going to use my own experience with BPA to illustrate how the political and legal environment can impact companies. Okay, so BPA is a chemical that for a really long time was found in virtually every plastic container that you that you drank out of, eaten out of, stored things in. And how BPA works is it um, it improves sort of the integrity of plastic, making it much more durable. Making foods contained in that plastic, um, it it helps to preserve them over the long run. So every time you eat a can of tomatoes that you might use for tomato sauce, every time you drink out of a plastic bottle. For the most part, if it has the, the number five or six in the recycling triangle, it's got BPA in it. Now, as adults, we have BPA in our system. We definitely do. Um, and so, and we're not necessarily impacted by it. But when these products started showing up in formula bottles and in pacifiers and in chew toys, um, countries like Canada and countries in the European Union started to ban it. And the reason why is because in animals, lab animals, it showed an impact um, on their hormone levels, and that can lead to all sorts of problems for children. So the United States actually <laughs> just, uh, I believe in 2012, decided to ban BPA in uh, consumer products that were geared toward children. In Canada and companies, or in countries in the United Kingdom, I'm sorry, in the European Union, they had banned it much earlier because um, of the impact on children. So this is just one example of a change that happened and then companies have to respond to it. So now if you're Gerber or you're Medela or you're one of these companies that's making baby products, you need to change, right? You need to reformulate your product. Um, and so, you know, as laws change, as politics change, companies also have to pay attention and to be able to adapt to those changes. All right, the last one we're going to talk about is the sociocultural environment. 
the sociocultural environment, and if you know if you've taken a, a sociology course before, or you've talked in other classes about the impact of culture, this has a huge, huge impact on companies. It could be negative, it could be positive. Um, and I'm going to use Lowe's and the Home Depot as a great example. So the, the, the Home Depot and Lowe's, they're virtually competitors, right? They pretty much sell the same types of goods and services. But if you've been into either one of these places, you can tell right away that they have an entirely different marketing plan, right? When I go into the Home Depot, I'm slightly terrified. And the reason why is because it looks like a place that a contractor is going to spend his or her time, right? That the floors are concrete, everything's on these large sort of metallic bins, things are kind of labeled confusingly to me. And so when I go into the Home Depot, it doesn't really appeal to me. Lowe's, on the other hand, when you walk into Lowe's, it's kind of like walking into a Best Buy, right? There's there's demos set up everywhere. There's prototypes of what your kitchen would actually look like. Um, it almost looks like a department store versus a Home Depot. But virtually, again, they're competitors. What makes this so interesting is that Lowe's saw an opportunity. Okay, and here's why. After some market research was conducted, Lowe's figured out that it wasn't men that were making decisions about home improvement projects. It was actually women. And so Lowe's came up with the idea of, hey, let's change our marketing mix a little bit. Let's make our stores women friendly. Let's make um, the layout, how we find things, how our, our customer service agents greet customers. Let's change that so that it appeals more to, to women. And that's just one example of Lowe's looking at the sociocultural environment, particularly of women, and making changes based on that. So the sociocultural environment deals with looking at changes in consumer taste, in, in preferences, even in consumer behavior, and making changes to things like your products or your store so that it better adapts and meets the needs of, of your target market. So in closing, I just want to sum up by reminding you what's so important about paying attention to the marketing environment. Again, it's things going around, around things going on around you externally that could either hurt you or help you if you're a company. And really the bottom line is you gotta pay attention to these things because if you don't adapt, you're either gonna be harmed, so your sales will go down, your profits will go down, or you're missing out on a chance to be helped by those changes. You might be able to reach consumers in a different way, in a more competitive way, if you're paying attention to what's going on around you. All right, that sums up our conversation, and I'll talk to you soon, bye.